good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our distinguished seminar series, the, the, the first uh, official talk of the, the series. Uh, uh, the perceptive amongst you will uh, note that I'm not uh, Sarkis Mantelaris, who <laughs> unfortunately is ind indisposed today. Uh, so I have the privilege of introducing our speaker. Uh, but even though Sarkis isn't here, I, thought, I just thought uh, since he's usually standing here, I'd take this opportunity to thank him for the excellent work he does in organizing our Distinguished Seminar Series uh, over the years and getting some interesting themes and some really distinguished people in. So thank you, Sarkis, wherever you are. And uh, as, as you will know from uh, those of you that are regulars here, our Distinguished Seminar Series aims to invite uh, distinguished speakers from all over the world, uh, and they come and visit the department, they learn about our research and teaching activities, uh, they meet our academic colleagues and research groups, and uh, hopefully we can uh, develop relationships uh, and uh, this will lead to further collaborations. Uh, it's also uh, a unique opportunity uh, for all of us to be informed about our visitors success stories and learn about their ongoing research and to be inspired by their ideas and their vision. Uh, you remember that we started uh, this series with uh, Professor Venkat Subramanian from uh, Columbia University who delivered the Roger Sargent lecture. And today's distinguished speaker is Professor Philip Westmoreland from the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the North Carolina State University. Uh, Professor Mo uh, Westmoreland is uh, spending his sabbatical here at Imperial uh, in mechanical engineering, in fact, which indicates the uh, multifaceted nature of our engineering departments here. And he's here holding a, a Lever Hume visiting professorship. Um, Phil obtained his uh, BS degree uh, from uh, North Carolina. And... Uh, it, that was in 1973, uh, an MSc at LSU in 74, and then uh, after a period at Oak Ridge, he then went back and did his uh, PhD at MIT in 1986, and all this in chemical engineering. Uh, as I mentioned, he was a research engineer. Uh, he was telling me about the coal conversion project at Oak Ridge National Lab from 74 to 79. Uh, then when he obtained his PhD, he joined the faculty of the chemical engineering department at uh, the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and uh, was there until 2009. And then during that period, he served at the National Science Foundation from 2006 to 2009. Currently, he's, as I said, professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at North Carolina State. Uh, he's also an honorary professor at Nanjing University of Technology and uh, Professor Anvite at the Université de, L de Lorraine. Um, Professor Westmoreland's research interests focus on reaction kinetics and engineering. Uh, his approaches include experimentation, computational chemistry, and re reactive flow modeling, increasingly aided by information science. So he brings a, together the whole gamut of experimental and modeling and theoretical techniques. And uh, the main driver behind his research is clean energy from fossil and biofuels. But he's also been involved in other things like developing fire-safe polymers, hypergolic ro rocket fuels, and plasma processing of microelectronics. So a very broad range of interests uh, with a common theme, which I think we'll see this afternoon. He's uh, a co-author of uh, a multitude of uh, publications and five books. Um, it's, he's also currently a trustee of the educational non-profit Cash Corporation and served as its president from 2004 to 2006 and is a past board member of the Combustion Institute, the Council of Chemical Research and AICHE and was the founding chair of AICHE's Computational Molecular Science and Engineering Forum which resonates a lot with activities going on at Imperial College at the moment. And in 2013, he served as the president of AICHE. Uh, his teaching, his research, and service have been recognized by many awards, amongst them the Lawrence Berkeley Labs 
a National Labs David Shirley Award and uh, the National Science Foundation Director's Award for Collaborative Integration. And uh, there are others that uh, there are too numerous to mention uh, in a short introduction. But uh, let me uh, ask you to join me in uh, warmly welcoming Professor Philip Westmoreland, who's going to share with us his experience and his research work on opportunities and challenges in a new golden age of chemical engineering. Phil, we look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you for such a lavish introduction. Uh, the, I will talk a little bit about how my background affects what I'm about to tell you, but I want to talk about two things that I'm passionate about. One thing is that this is such a great time to be a chemical engineer, and I want to argue that indeed it is a new golden age of chemical engineering, and I'll explain why that is. But along with the opportunities come challenges, and there's one of the things that very clearly uh, echoes that is the area of biofuels. Let's see, we can get the slides to change. Well, you can trust me that it, <laughs> that it is an opportunity. But making and using biofuels presents a real opportunity in terms of our transition, uh, dealing with carbon dioxide in a balanced fashion. On the other hand, uh, we have real challenges there. You're still making carbon dioxide. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't get that to work. Let's try that. Take this out. There we go. I think that changed. So yes, making and using biofuels is an example of that. The background that I wanted to talk about, the relevant background, includes the, of course, the scientific work that we've done, some different covers that we've had. Uh, all actually related to the biofuels area. But uh, Jeff mentioned you know, my background in chemical engineering essentially as a kineticist, but time in industry, uh, Union Carbide, Oak Ridge, in academia and in government. So bringing in different perspectives, uh, it is a US perspective, and uh, that's of course an important caveat, restriction on what I say. But there's another influence too that I have to mention that I've had a front row seat to watch the changes of chemical engineering in terms of biology becoming more and more an integral part of the profession through my wife, who's a chemical engineer and physician and executive with GlaxoSmithKline, developing new drugs. Uh, when I first met her in the 70s, it was, uh, it, there was no part that biotechnology was in chemical engineering, but how it fit into the core, there was a problem. It was just one of the things that we did so one of the things as far as arguing the golden age of chemical engineering is saying that we have to keep in mind what makes chemical engineering chemical engineering. What is the core? First though, what I want to do is to spend some time talking about biofuel research and then come to the, the bigger view because there are technical issues here that are scientifically extremely interesting. We can find fascinating areas in many of the domains that we work in. Uh, but technologically, societally, certainly biofuels seem inevitable as far as having a sustainable economy. Uh, any mined resource is finite. Uh, is 500 years far enough away that we have to think about it? That's how much we think we have in terms of coal left. But we know the problems with coal, too. Uh, and indications are we actually have to use everything for now. So. There's this advantage of biofuels, but right now, with cheap oil and gas, can it be justified? Uh, it's an open question. It's a fair question. And of course, it still burns and generates carbon dioxide. Uh, there are the technical issues. But then this issue of energy, water, food, nexus, if we're going to be using biomass that could be a food resource, there's an ethical dimension there, too. Also, growing biomass requires water, 
an increasingly short resource in terms of availability. So plainly, chemical engineers are natural, vital participants in all these different dimensions as focused as our individual research projects may be on the science that's involved in any one of these questions. So let me tell you a little bit about the science and then zoom out a little bit. We use basically three different approaches. Uh, we use pyrolysis techniques. Uh, that's GC by GC, time of flight mass spec. We use computational chemistry and we use flow pyrolysis techniques and molecular beam science. I'm going to focus today largely on this, although using some insights from these experimental takes techniques that we use. But the idea of being able to understand how something as complicated as a piece of wood, how it decomposes, but using elementary reactions to understand that is something that we are just now reaching the point where we can do that. So you start with woody biomass. It's not necessarily wood. It needs to be a lignocellulosic material, though. That is, you've got a crop, you've got cell walls. The cell walls are made of fibrils of cellulose uh, with a rather more amorphous hemicellulose and lignin that wraps the whole thing. I want to focus today on cellulose. Uh, we certainly have a lot of experience with cellulose. I see pieces of cellulose on the tables uh, in front of you, the paper that we use. We know how to make very pure cellulose. But what's the structure? Each fibril is made up of hydrogen-bonded chains of polyglucose uh, that are connected both top to bottom and sideways by a series of hydrogen bonds. We have to remove the hemicellulose or convert it. We have to remove the lignin. Let's focus on the cellulose. There's been a lot of work done on that because we are very interested in cellulose. If you look at the symmetry here, the top view I had was very six-membered ring, beautifully symmetrical. As I rotated around here and looked sideways, though, you see that there's also a top-to-bottom symmetry that's there, too. You've got many carbon-hydrogen and oxygen-hydrogen bonds that are putting, pointing above and below the plane of the molecule there. We know how hydrogen bonds work, those lineups of different OH groups. There's plenty of opportunity for that. The symmetry helps too, but there are also so-called beta glycosidic bond linkages that help shape the flatness of the molecule that allows this symmetry. If we look, zoom into the molecular structure, Carbon's in gray, oxygen's red, hydrogen's white, and we just look at it uh, as a single unit here. This is basically glucose or a glucopyranose unit. In particular, it's a beta glucose. The beta indicates the direction that this oxygen is shaping is coming out as it connects to the other glucose units. We'll label the numbers one here on this side of the oxygen that's away from a CH2OH group, another, another, number four, number five. So five carbons and an oxygen in the ring to make the glucose ring, a, a, a tetrahydropyran ring, and then the sixth one, a CH2OH group off on the side. The nature of the glycosidic bond that connects, that actually makes the polymer of cellulose. Note that if we had this bond at this hydrogen down here, if the oxygen and hydrogen had switched places, it would not be a flat molecule. So that position, which is called a beta position, it's beta relative to the CH2OH, is part of the symmetry. And it's that crystallinity that makes wood hard, that makes it bare strength, but it's also a challenge for chemical processing. It's hard to get a catalyst inside an organic crystal. Uh, it's hard to do any sort of biomolecular reaction that's there. So there are technologies that use uh, liquids. I heard about some lovely research going on at Imperial uh, in this area today. There's also biological treatments, and of course, 
biologically, organisms have to chomp through the cell walls and get inside to these crystals as well before you can tackle a single polymer chain. Most commonly, the approach that is being considered right now is thermal technique, rapid pyrolysis, rapid heating and decomposition. So there's a question about how that happens. Uh, our goal is really to come up with a usable model based on elementary reactions, that is, the pyrolysis chemistry to use it. And of course, we're also interested in the combustion, uh, the pyrolysis that makes it, combustion that uses it. These three images here, the first one is a 2009 article uh, that George Huber and I wrote, discovering some of the pathways empirically by which it was breaking down, but not yet being able to say quantitatively what the rates were. Uh, in this paper here in 2012, Vikram Sashadri and I developed a model for understanding at an elementary scale of how the cellulose molecule breaks up. And that's what I'll give you a, a quick version of today. Uh, but in addition, uh, Katerina kosi hunghaus and a group of collaborators and I have a lovely experiment out at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory at the Advanced Light Source. And we've done a lot of work in sampling flames to understand the chemistry by which it burns. Can we do it efficiently? Can we improve the selection of products? What we want to do is figure out what are the specific elementary reactions of pyrolysis that are happening, and the products. Uh, the particular products that you make determine whether the bio oil is useful. So experimentally, in this first article over here, we had identified intermediates and products. There's been a lot of work in that area. We used an experimental technique, an analytical technique of liquid chromatography with mass spec that revealed new insights in what was actually happening. But then, what types of reactions? And I would say that what we're trying to do is figure, are they radical reactions? Are they ionic? Are they pericyclic? And when you get to organic chemistry reactions that don't involve transition metals, those are the choices. You can categorize everything. And our study indicates it's not radical, at least in the cellulose. It is in lignin that it's not ionic unless you're in solution, but that in fact it is this pericyclic reaction. I'll show some images to explain what that is. First, pyrolysis to date has men using lumped models. We're all good engineers. We know that if we can describe with a lumped model, that's fine. We don't need to know the details to accomplish the engineering objective. When that engineering objective cannot be met by the lumped model, we can enlarge it. That was what was done. Uh, expand, say that cellulose goes through some sort of active phase that can make char and water, or it can make levoglucosan, a bicyclic that's going to be central to our story, or decomposition products that convert into the molecules glycolaldehyde and hydroxytupropanone that the levoglucosan can convert into secondary taurine gas. And again, these are all sort of reasonable seeming activation energies. The A factor is a little harder to understand in condensed phase kinetics, but they all seem pretty plausible. But what do they mean? And do they tell us about what the products are? Well, except for levoglucosan, glycolaldehyde, and hydroxypropanone, no. We don't know what it is. And we know there's more than that. There's a lot more than that. So. Uh, for that matter, even what's this active cellulose? Uh, uh, Agarwal and uh, Auerbach at Massachusetts actually were able to identify using molecular dynamics that active cellulose is a transition to almost a melt, an amorphous stage of the crystal the cellulose for thermal reasons. So any model that works has to have something behind it that's plausible, right? Otherwise, well, if we're real lucky, maybe not. But think of the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is absolutely impossible. I mean, how can you have this? Molecules that have point mass, that don't interact with each other, and yet we know how useful the ideal gas law. If we're in a domain where something that has a deeper principle behind it can go into a simplified form, we'll make use of that. 
Well, because you make so many different products in making bio oil, we do need to dig more deeply. We can observe overall kinetics. This is work from the uh, synthetic polymer work where this is polystyrene. You can look at the mass loss as you ramp temperature up, a thermogravimetric analysis, and can infer 289 kilojoules. That seems reasonable. It's single sort of rate. It's close to the bond energy of the polymer chain. So you begin thinking, what mechanism? Well, just pulling the chain apart. That must be the rate limiting step. Likewise, if we take polymethyl methacrylate, we get first order regions, but they look like three different domains. And indeed, uh, as we look at it, there are different things. But this energy looks like that bond scission energy. This one looks like the beta scission as a radical unzips the polymer. You can begin to hypothesize elementary steps that occur, even though you're looking at an overall phenomenon. What's going on in the middle? Well, that's a different problem. So what we can do is do chemical analyses. Here, for example, for the polymethyl methacrylate is a thermogravimetric analysis. The black line is the weight as a function of temperature as the temperature ramps up. And you can see two domains here. Uh, this is the heat trace, the differential scanning calorimetry, the heat flow in milliwatts. And you see that actually there's a, an event here that isn't changed in the mass. It's melting. There's a phase change. And this first domain that shows up in the mass trace also shows in the heat flux, as does the second. The product, though, is all methyl methacrylate. So again, we're talking about approaches that give us glimpses of the elementary reaction that allow us to formulate ideas, but it's not giving us the whole picture. If we look at polystyrene, uh, it looks like there's just more or less one big bump, but you get three different products, uh, and you see the mass falling off with one sweep, a little bump maybe in the heat flow. What's going on? The inference is that it's random chain scission, that it's beta scission unzipping, they're in competition one with the other. Well, that's not enough to build a reaction engineering mechanism on. So what we turn to is more detailed experiments. So the TGA DSC that I mentioned, other flash paralyzer, flow reactor, and then uh, two-dimensional GC with time of flight and aspect. I know there's some experience here with this technique, but it's definitely a kid in the candy store sort of technique. Uh, here's one time through one column, the other column in series, the color, the redder it is, the higher the peak is. So you're looking almost like at a contour map of chemistry. It's a, a two-dimensional chromatogram. So if you tilt it on its side, I know it's a little dark, but you can see these peaks in this region here pointing up. But particularly, I want to go over to here, levoglucosan. Levoglucosan is a key and signature product coming from cellulose. What does that tell us about the mechanism? Well, in the work that uh, Lynn and Huber and I did, we said that as we look at it, where well, there's this active cellulose idea, this idea of the melt, okay, that makes sense. What we found by using LC mass spec with the flash pyrolysis, we found that this ring here, here's shown isolated, levoglucosan, this glucose tetrahydroperan type ring with a bridging CH2OH across it, seemed to be the first product. Actually, what we found with the LC was that versions of levoglucosan with up to seven different glucose rings attached to it were it. So we hypothesized that what we were seeing was a break somehow of the chain, that the way the polymer was breaking down was to make a bicyclic ring. How would that happen, though? The idea is it could form other species, uh, but propose that the key polymer scission step was breaking that 1,4-glycosidic bond and making a levoglucosan. So what we did was turn to use glucose as a model compound. Uh, here's glucose. Uh, there is glucose. Actually, this is just beta glucose because glucose can take different forms. Again, I talked about the alpha and the beta. Uh, 
D-glucose is a linear open chain version. And what other people besides chemical engineers interested in biofuels are interested in how, how cellulose pyrolyzes? Well, the tobacco industry is certainly one. And the tobacco industry has done a lot of work on pyrolysis of organic matter because it's their product, basically. Uh, and Sanders uh, had published work in 2003 proposing a network saying this linear glucose could interconvert to beta and alpha, which she said, oh, that's just all in the mix together. But that levoglucosan would come from the cyclic species along with its other bicyclic sister here. That from the linear, you would make these C5 rings, furan-type rings that are over here. It was empirical. He did some very nice labeling work to try to see if that was plausible, but it was still empirical. So what we did was take those different hypotheses and combine it with computational quantum chemistry. We're in the gas phase, but we're not. We don't have to be. What we're really saying is the molecules aren't interacting with each other unless we specify an interaction. So we get reactants, we get transition states, we get products. The uh, approach we used, the model chemistry, as John Popel called it, was CBS QB3 using the Gaussian software. Also a uh, software called ChemRate to calculate the thermochemistry using statistical mechanics and to calculate the rate constants using transition state theory, including anharmonicities, including tunneling, different sort of effects that you might be worried about, but the main challenge is finding the transition state. Once we find a transition state, you actually have to concern, be concerned whether it's the transition state that you want, because even just a methyl group rotating has a transition state to bump over energy barriers. So the internal reaction coordinate approach starts at the transition state and follows a minimum energy path in either direction to say what the reactants and products are. Uh, we did run solvation calculations to establish that there was no effect of the other molecules and have determined that the reactions that we were interested in were not affected. If it were in a water solution, uh, that would not be the case. Okay. So let me use the unimolecular isomerizations to explain the pericyclic chemistry. Let me back off from that for just a second if it'll hold. Here's beta in boat or chair. Here's the linear. Here's the alpha. When I say boat or chair, you remember boat or chair. It's whether we're uh, puckered up like this, uh, where things start getting closer to each other, or whether we're in some sort of chair configuration of one sort or another. What we found was that we could find transition states for unimolecular isomerizations that interconverted the boat and the chair. Well, that's easy. I just interconverted that in the model in front of you. But that we could find unimolecular steps from each structure to the linear form and to the alpha. Notice the earlier hypothesis was this just converted to both, and these were interconvertible. They have to go through the linear form. Here's the interesting thing. The transition state involve these cyclic structures. That's why it's called pericyclic. It's around the perimeter of a ring of electronic changes that are occurring. If you count the number, some of them are six-membered and some are four-membered rings that form. Here's a four-membered ring here. Here's a six-membered ring. But they are all non-radical. There are no ions involved. This class of reactions was established back in the 60s by Woodward and Hoffman. Uh, Hoffman won his Nobel Prize for it some 30 years later. Hoffman, uh, Woodward had already won his for synthesizing vitamin D. What we found, though, was that we could do this and we could come out with rate constants that seemed plausible. The other thing, even more of a surprise, though, was that water can come in. See the six-membered ring here, one, two, three, four, five, six. Water, or another ROH group, could come in and catalyze the conversion, at least from this form of beta glucose, from this form of alpha glucose, from the chair directly, but couldn't convert the interchange. One of the H's, the one in the back, 
is a spectator. It's not participating in the reaction. Furthermore, it's giving up a hydrogen is picking up a hydrogen. So you start with water, or ROH, and you end up with ROH. It's just a different hydrogen. So ROH has acted as a catalyst for the reaction. No transition metals involved. The rate constants themselves, you see fairly low activation energies. For the boat to chair, there's still about six kcals of energy in the unimolecular conversion. But you find that for the beta to linear, the linear to alpha, you get about 34, 48 for the unimolecular. But with this water-assisted catalysis, it drops at about 10 to uh, 20 kcals. Uh, compared to the unimolecular. Well, that's very interesting. Here from this form, you see again about 25 kcals lower. So this idea that water can act as a catalyst, not just a solvent, but as a catalyst, is profoundly interesting. If we switch and think about the levoglucosan formation, it turns out we can remove an OH from this one position or from the six position. So there's a choice to get the right rate constant. You have to figure out which one. It turns out it's breaking from the one position. Well, guess what? The 1,4 glycosidic bond was the link between the glucose rings. So what you see is may, uh, that we could found a unimolecular four-membered state or a bimolecular six-centered state. This is the one that ended up on the cover. To understand better, OK, here we are right now. This is glucose. I've stripped away OHs just to make it clear. The calculations included them, but to just make it a little less busy. So here's our number one carbon, hydrogen. This is where you would have the linkage to the rest of the cellulose. Here's our CH2OH, and here's this water coming in. As we react, what happens is that this linkage here to that oxygen attaches to another group here. The water is regenerated by plucking off a hydrogen, and we form this bridge across here. That's levoglucosan, this bicyclic compound. How does that translate to cellulose, though? Well, first point is that even with the glucose, we were able to do calculations with different alcohols coming in, different ROHs, to say that the identity of the ROH doesn't really matter. We get about the same activation energy. So that means if it's another cellulose or another glucose, it could explain it. Because there are lots of OHs present in glucose and in cellulose. Second, if we look at the bridge itself, the glycosidic bond, I showed it with an R is equal to H. But you see the activation energy doesn't really change if we make it instead of an H on the other side of the ether oxygen, make it a methyl, make it a ethyl, isopro, doesn't matter. So we've explained this breakdown of the cellulose molecules by saying that what happens is that you get a cleavage in the cellulose by this unimolecular or bicyclic route. You split it, and thus you have levoglucosan attached to the rest of the cellulose and everything to the right looks like a piece of cellulose. This process repeats itself, including in these short oligomers, until it makes all levoglucosan. And then we have other calculations to show that you make these other products. We explain them. But the crucial thing, the breakdown step of the cellulose comes out clearly here. We're doing the same thing with hemicellulose. Lignin breaks down by a radical model. We're interested in doing that and experiments. But before we leave this, I want to mention there's an important area that we worked in called reactive molecular dynamics, by which you can do molecular dynamics and then observe the reactions happen. What I'll show here dimly, through a mirror darkly, is uh, a clump of polymethyl methacrylate. I mentioned before we've done experiments on that. But if we make it move. Ah, oh, good. <laughs> what you see is you see things moving around. Keep moving. There we go. You can see methyl spinning around here, pausing for effect, obviously. 
And you see bonds stretching as the polymer moves around. Uh, it, it gave up. The, uh, what you would see, though, is that you get a bond break here, pulled apart, basically sort of ratcheted apart as the molecule moves around and is entangled. And then it comes back together because it's in, still in close proximity. It's got to transport itself away from the other radical to keep from recombining. In the end, this bond here breaks and the molecule begins to unzip before a recombination can happen. In fact, the very end unzips and gives you carbon, monox carbon dioxide and methyl group forming. This is like being a Maxwell's demon sitting inside this paralyzing molecule and seeing what's happening going on. So it's a very promising technique. We're working uh, on the computer science of it as well as the chemistry of it. Uh, and doing some work on bio-oils right now. But in our synthetic polymers, we were able to account for the quantitatively for the activation energies that are observed, which are much lower than the bond energies. So, okay, so now I'm gonna switch to, to context. First, I'm gonna talk about how, what's the context of biofuels research in the context of climate change? We have to consider that. It's an issue there, but of course, with oil and gas changing as well, uh, we have to deal with that. Furthermore, this pivotal role of chemical engineers uh, factors in as well, because again, we have a lot of tools that are very pertinent to that. And when I say we as chemical engineers, I don't mean to be completely chauvinistic about chemical engineers. Of course, we, uh, we live in an increasingly boundaryless disciplines. I would argue there's still an important role for the disciplines as far as particular knowledge, but I've noticed that chemical engineers and mechanical engineers are really good about reaching across perceived intellectual boundaries. So uh, the point is that this sort of attitude, as well as our particular technical skills, are beneficial. So first thing I would point to, with the change in oil reserves that are present and gas reserves, now if you look at renewables on one axis, oil supply on one axis, gas supply on one axis, you can talk about different domains and look how prices are affected differently by changes here. So the authors, uh, Burns et al, said this bottom case where there's no renewables, no oil, no gas is a hydrocarbon starved economy. Uh, plainly, if we are at oil supply and gas supply zero because there are no resources left, uh, that still leaves renewable, but even number five is the, they call it the green nirvana. I'm not sure it's so nirvana, but that you have high oil and gas prices because there's so little oil and gas. At the far end, number eight, you see feuding fu fuels. You've got oil, shale gas, renewables, everything fighting it out. The point is that this competition among oil, among gas, among renewables, right now does not favor renewables. The short-term solution, if we have cheap oil and gas, does not favor renewables. Should we not work on it? Well, maybe financially you can't, but intellectually we know we should, both for the science and because of the long-term benefit. Second, why should chemical engineers be involved? Well, I would argue that the sort of chemical engineering expertise that we have about fundamentals of chemistry and applying them whether you're working in chemistry or transport or process control, it's all about putting chemistry to use. That the expertise that we have is not only valuable technologically, but is key to the most important technological advances we have now, these essentials of life, health, water, food, to the quality of life, energy, safety, security, convenience, in fact, we have to argue that that's, that's critical. And it's not just our expertise, but the fact that chemical engineers, and again, I was saying mechanical engineers, we're taught to work in multidisciplinary teams to bring the expertise of one person together with another person. Uh, from the very beginning, we start looking at systems furthermore. I would argue that it means that we should have more of a role in wise public decision making. Uh, and for that matter, in educating the public. 
So let me expand on this notion of a golden age and why this is relevant to the topic of biofuels. The first golden age arguably was 1905 to 29. Chemical engineering began in the UK years before that uh, and then sprung up. Uh, Davis's work in 1887 was followed in 1888 by the first degree program in the US at MIT, my alma mater. Although Penn says, well, we were there too, and other schools say, well, we were there too. But it, there was this burst of ideas, but it was really this period uh, around the First World War when gasoline began to be more important. Uh, industrial dyes were a key part of the British uh, chemical industry, but industrial chemicals in general. And with the onset of the war, while Germany had dominated many of these areas, it became much more international. The uh, onset of cars and airplanes and the like uh, drove new demand for gasoline. But it's not just these contextual things, but also defining the profession. Davis had articulated what looks a lot like unit operations, but the real breakthrough, the flowering of ideas that happened after World War I, uh, largely stemmed from work that Arthur D. Little, uh, Doc Lewis, William Walker, and W.H. McAdams did in creating their book uh, on unit operations. And that idea, that way of categorizing dissimilar seeming processes by their common elements was very powerful and triggered a huge amount of activity in that period and in the subsequent years. The next golden age, though, was post-World War II, this time where, again, gasoline was important. Uh, this gas station uh, was still there by the time that I was at MIT in the 1980s, but uh, in faint letters it says TCP, uh, Exxon, SO back then, was it put a tiger in your tank. It was talking about making aromatics from aliphatics, catalytic reforming. So Shell with platformate that they're advertising here was platinum reforming to make aromatics for high octane gasoline. But fine chemicals became more important, particularly in the pharma business. The advent of more polymers and the general economic boom that came after the recovery from World War II. And as had happened earlier, the abundance of oil and gas. Transport phenomena is the obvious choice for the intellectual advance that pushed that, uh, that third, second golden age. But Incorporated into that is applied mathematics and very sophisticated reaction engineering that developed, too. So now if we think more broadly about why this would be a new golden age, well, hydrocarbons plainly play a role. Abundance of hydrocarbons opens up all sorts of energy and chemical possibilities. But it's not just that. It's biology. Biology becoming a chemical science makes biology a core science of chemical engineering, because we do applied chemistry. Computing is another factor. In the previous golden ages, a, uh, the computers, at least that I remember, Professor Hoyt Hoddle at MIT was a radiation transfer guy. His computers were a team of women with adding machines in a room in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Having electronic computers, uh, and of course, we can go if we want to talk about women, it's uh, Ada Countess Lovelace that we would go back to. The advent of having powerful computation changes things dramatically. Manufacturing um, is a bit of a problem in the English language dominated countries uh, because it suggests manual, suggests assembly lines, but you only quickly have to tell people that it includes the things that we do. They accept it's manufactured goods, and much manufacturing is turning towards being more focused on processes compared to assembly. And finally, the range and diversity of topics that we have within chemical engineering, the range of people from around the world working in it, is another key source of strength that is more than ever the case and makes this a time for a golden age. So first, the gas and oil abundance. Here's I promised the U.S. perspective, Marcellus Shale, that's where I first heard about it. And then I went to China and people were saying, no, no, you don't understand. It changes everything. There's a huge amount just in the U.S. And by the way, you see the Bakken Reserve, 
which has been a target of a lot of political discussion, of course, doesn't really end at the border. This is just showing the U.S. reserves. It extends well up into Canada. Indeed, worldwide, if you look at shale gas reserves, the flag circles are the total amount of potential uh, material, it's the potential gas. The blue is the proven reserves, and the U.S. has a lot of proven reserves and a lot of uh, expected reserves, but look at China. Very little proven so far, but China, which is more dependent than Britain and the, UK and the U.S. have ever been on imported oil, has potentially huge amounts of gas and oil that are in shale formations and around the world. Uh, it, it, it truly is worldwide activity. But you see interplays between oil and gas as a result. Much of the shale gas is wet gas. It contains uh, condensable liquids. So for example, U.S. propane price, here's from 97 to 2015 and then projections ahead and early data from 2016. If you look at the blue and the black, the crude oil and propane were pretty well correlated until 2009. Since then, it's been tracking natural gas. One reason, especially recently, is because the propane is coming from natural gas, wet liquids with the gas. So you see this uh, nonlinear sort of interaction between the different expenses that are there. And of course, there's the climate change issue. Here's an International Energy Agency uh, article a few years ago from the U.S. Washington Post uh, saying, well, what can we do? If we want to avoid a two degree C rise in global temperatures, then we'll need a certain amount of low carbon infrastructure in place by 2020, which is four years away from now. Um, they said, actually, with solar wind renewables, 27% per year increase. And of course, the leading country there is China, making a huge commitment to renewable resources there, especially to solar and wind. However, if the world wanted to make a concerted push to meet the 2 degrees C target, all sectors would have to chip in to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, including conservation, on our way to 6 degrees in this time frame instead of 2. Well, there are uncertainties, of course. We know that one big Krakatoa volcano blow up could make the world cool for a number of years. We see the effect of El Nino's, but we're talking climate. We're not talking how the weather is changing right now. Chemical engineers are in the perfect place to help the public understand uncertainties like that. In the US, I was horrified to find out that of the 65% of the US public that accept climate change. 10% believe it based on evidence they have seen, like coral reefs bleaching, ice cap melting, the Northwest Passage opening. 10% believe on faith that scientists say so. OK. Uh, the remaining 45% decide because the weather has been hot or cold, and since scientists can't agree, I have to make up my own mind. That horrifies me. Chemical engineers, engineers and scientists in general, can help the public understand that just because there's uncertainty doesn't mean that you shouldn't make plans. If there's a 99% chance that you're going to get hit by a truck today, you're not going to ignore that. You're going to take some kind of action. You may just buy insurance, but you'll take some sort of, of action there. So that's why I say that this is one area where chemical engineers can not only contribute technically, but also to societal understanding. Biology. Biology has become a molecular science, has become a chemical science. Uh, again, it always was part of it. Alliances with medicine introduced new angles. The alliances with creating new products is an important aspect of it. But it turns out personalized medicine development in the US has a big cadre of chemical engineers involved in that because not afraid of numbers, comfortable with using statistics, understand chemistry, connection to uh, technical realities. Uh, the idea of materials that are biocompatible or that are, say, just biomimetic 
aided by this openness. Here's an example of a 3D printer. 3D printing is a very interesting development. It's burst in after, it's one of these overnight successes that's been around 30 years and suddenly it catches on because it adds new features to making objects, to manufacturing objects. Well, tissue may be an area. There's a company in San Diego, Organovo, that makes 3D tissue printing cells, uh, initially starting with blood vessels. So again, chemical engineers match up well with that. Computing also, uh, the variety of different interfaces, mobile computing, uh, this is the second fastest computer in the world, the one at Oak Ridge. But computing is not just computers. Computers is a cyber infrastructure. If roads and highways, if, uh, if uh, electrical connections, if sewer lines are an infrastructure for society, then the internet and the computers and the software and the people who create the software that's all a cyber infrastructure for simulation, for prediction, for networking data. Uh, everybody seems to be paying attention, but somebody may have their cell phone. They're looking up, what did he just say? Let me look that up. You can find networked information wherever you are right now, on your mobile devices or otherwise. Visualization makes a huge difference. And the idea of analytics, decision making using statistics, is an interesting twist on statistics, but it is more than that. Because we're all working with big data. Here's a, I read a blog series for AICHE on information technology and ran a word cloud on it. Sure enough, data comes out big, analytics come up, cyber infrastructure, manufacturing. Here is a graphical way of looking at a text piece and saying what are the ideas that really popped up in there. That's very different from taking graphs and charts, which we also make use of, but the different ways of being able to use data, uh, all kinds of digital data, whether it's for process operations, for environmental monitoring, or the supply chain, the raw materials coming in, the products going out, all very significant. And indeed, since much of chemical engineering is manufacturing, what we see, and again, I can speak for the US public, in that they think of it as durable goods, cars, washing machines, and so on. That's what you manufacture. But if you tell them, well, you have to manufacture fuels, you have to manufacture crisps, they know that, of course, you have to, uh, that you have to manufacture pharmaceuticals, uh, microchips, and so on and so forth. So they accept this manufacturing, but public policy, uh, the knee-jerk sort of response is to think of durable goods, assembly, assembly lines, machining and the like. So this broader viewpoint is important because I would not hazard to guess how many people here have been into a manufacturing facility, but every one of us here is part of the manufacturing enterprise. We're academics that are trying to create processes or understand processes or products that will be manufactured. We're, if we are outside and we're selling these materials, we're part of the manufacturing enterprise. If we're managing it or defending IP or even educating chemical engineers to do it, we're part of the manufacturing enterprise. So uh, in US academic circles, manufacturing is not really thought of as a key part of what we're doing. But of course, people adjust to the idea that it is. And chemical engineers should be at the forefront. Part of it is this aspect that I said about the process and property-driven manufacturing, more and more manufacturing being done by processes rather than by assembly. Of course, those of you working in microelectronics know that we've been doing additive manufacturing for a long time now. Also subtractive when we etch, etch away, but these sorts of mix of processing tools, very important. You can get very intricate substances. This was a, uh, a geared structure made by 3D printing, putting down two different materials and eating away the third one so that you got the, the movements that's there. Intricate, but I tell you, this impressed me more. This is a bracket for a reactor in our vacuum chamber. The student had designed it. He said, before we machine it, let's see if it will fit. Did I design it right? He went to the library next door 
to our laboratory, made the bracket, said, yep, it, nope, that hole needs to be moved a little bit. It won't quite fit. The way it's changing what we're doing, uh, moving beyond one-off solutions, even to doing manufacturing of whole objects, is fascinating uh, in contrast to the traditional assembly-driven manufacturing. Uh, then there are other key aspects of manufacturing that are also chemical engineering strengths, uh, including the simulation, process design, where Imperial is one of the world leaders, the use of applying cyber infrastructure, clean, green, and high tech, says chemical engineering, all over the place. And of course, automation. The idea of automation as being high productivity actually came earlier in chemical engineering than the other disciplines. Here's a, a graph I took from Jim Way, former dean of engineering at Princeton. He took the US data on percentage labor in industry, percentage labor in agriculture, plotted up the points and found historically the numbers fell in one trend. From 1810, where it was 82% in agriculture, to the 60s, where you began to see a turnover, still, agriculture was still non-zero. It just became higher and higher productivity. Fewer people to make more food than ever, to grow more food. In industry, though, you see this maximum that it's taking fewer and fewer people to make the goods. Well, we know that in the 60s what happened was the advent of robotics, the advent of different advanced manufacturing techniques. Hello, chemical engineering has been making large-scale quantities of materials for a long time with very few people. We're sort of the original high-productivity uh, engineering manufacturing. This is the US, but if we look internationally using 2000 data, these are the same lines that I just showed you on the previous graph. And with a few exceptions, many company, countries are following the same thing. Hong Kong is a little anomalous. They don't have any place for agriculture. But the point is that going to higher and higher productivity is a good thing. It's not going to zero. Chemical engineers have been in the vanguard of that. Finally, the diversity of chemical engineering Diversity in many senses. If we want to talk about the diversity of topics, though, I think we need to look and see what unifies chemical engineering. What is the core? If you look at any engineering discipline, I would argue that all engineering disciplines approach systems and solve systems problems. Of course, chemical engineers, when you get your first course in material energy balance, you have to get systems or you can't do the solution. So we get it early on. But then it's connected to a foundational science by tools of analysis. And the foundational science usually distinguishes different disciplines. If I say the foundational science is nuclear physics, you can guess what engineering discipline it would be. If it's electromagnetic physics, you would know. If it's molecular sciences, that's chemical engineering. Uh, so pick one target, say an oil refinery. It's got a supply chain. It's got environmental, it's got safety concerns, it rests on the molecular sciences, chemistry, increasingly also biology, and for a long time, materials. And we connect it with these tools, unit operations, transport phenomena, reaction engineering, control analytics, all these tools that we know, whether we're working in an oil refinery or making pharmaceuticals or developing fire-safe polymers or making microchips. That's really a commonality. The other way that we try to understand what chemical engineering is typically, uh, there's this sort of trite saying that chemical engineering is what chemical engineers do. Well, by itself, that is not satisfying. But if we look at particular people, so let's squeeze through a few well-known chemical engineers. Emil Jacobs recently stepped down as VP for Research and Development at ExxonMobil. All this stuff looks like chemical engineering. Was he doing process engineering? No. He was managing a large company with his experience in process engineering and product development and catalyst development. That's chemical engineering, but so is Ann Lee, who's senior VP at Genentech, a PhD from Yale. Uh, she's responsible for all clinical and commercial production technologies uh, with Genentech and Roche. Uh, one of the most famous chemical engineers in the world is Bob Langer, who pioneered tissue engineering, 
pioneered transdermal drug delivery. He's now behind, I think, 28 companies that he's spun off out of his group. Uh, he's the youngest person ever elected to the U.S. National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, National Institute of Medicine. Chemical engineering, that's chemical engineering, absolutely. And astronauts, uh, here are just a few from the U.S., most of them with materials expertise or medical expertise, but uh, at least one, Don Pettit, who's gone up three times for a cumulative total more than 365 days, who is more focused on uh, transport. Uh, now at Apple, formerly a government administrator, Lisa Jackson is now uh, head at Apple for development of uh, environmental regulations. She's another chemical engineer, so that's chemical engineering too. Now I take you to the most famous chemical engineers in the world, uh, certainly President Xi <laughs> is almost certainly the second most famous chemical engineer in the world. The vice premier of China is also a chemical engineer and while he was a, a party representative uh, working in the management of the organizations, she worked as a process engineer as well. But who do you think the most famous chemical engineer is? I would argue it's this guy. <laughs> And I would contend that his early preparation in chemical engineering is why he has been more concerned about technological issues and climate changes than previous popes have been. So there are many ways that chemical engineering plays out as being useful, but if you want to hear another view, here is a group of undergraduates at California State University, Long Beach, they're the officers of the AICHE student chapter. They were asked what areas they wanted to work in. Water, sustainable medicine, auto racing, biofuels business, automated environmental control system, micro, a huge diversity of things. But again, this building around the molecular sciences is really a core idea there. So to conclude, I would argue that we have two key professional purposes in our careers. One is to create economic value, taking things that aren't worth as much, making the products that are more valuable. And the second is advancing quality of life. If you create economic value and don't advance the quality of life, you're on the wrong side of history. You have to do both. And you can't advance the quality of life very far unless you create economic value. These are both important. So, in this new golden age, we need a breadth of chemical engineers, a breadth of expertise. We need to draw from other people. And we, all of us, you and I, can shape that future. Thank you for your attention. Thanks very much indeed, Phil. That was some scope from that. <laughs> so uh, we have time for a few questions. Sure. Take them and any comments. Faculty are fine. I'm looking for the student section. Please. Um, a very quick one. If you, we've got a cheap source of no carbon energy, such as nuclear or hypothetically very cheap electricity, do you think pyrolysis would replace incineration for all waste disposal? I don't know if I'm specifically prepared to answer that, but in general, I would fall back on the idea that we have to analyze the entire system. Uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, for those who don't know it, was traditionally a large nuclear research complex. And you see very clearly that the nuclear industry is driven by the huge coal-fired steam plants at either end of the valley, supplying the energy for what was the separation of isotopes. So, you have to look at the whole system there. Of course, we're looking for the cleanest technology that can be there that is economically feasible. We know also that the public is not very good about choosing more expensive solutions regardless of the perceived long-term cost. So that's a place where we as chemical engineers have to aid with the system analysis as well. 
uh, may not be very satisfying, but I would say the principle is the most important thing at that. Where does the energy come from mm -hmm. uh, for these high temperature thermal processes? I mean, I just wonder how you see with the use of uh, uh, biomass materials, mm -hmm. the, the balance between uh, thermochemical processes and pyrolysis and enzymatic processes and how this links into the whole provision of energy chain. I think uh, I would... Without producing more mm -hmm. CO2, I'm Yeah, I think saying, I would yeah. broaden it uh, even more. Uh, Plainly, if we have a short-term solution that is acceptable, that's okay. In many cases, it's building infrastructure. Uh, while I worked in Washington for the U.S. government at the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Congress was seriously debating an ethical issue, soberly and sincerely, about whether it was ethical to use food for fuel to make alcohol from corn and use it for fuel. In a world where there are starving people, is that ethically justifiable? And they came to, uh, it raised my opinions of politicians greatly, they came to a rather nuanced decision that long term, it is not ethical, but in the short term, if you can create an infrastructure, for example, they were reasoning substituted by lign uh, lignocellulosic ethanol, possibly by biological methods, that it was justifiable because you could set up the long-term benefit by doing the activity now. So again, the system issue, how do you deal with the, the long-term aspect, I think is very important to that because I've, I'm very serious. We have to both create economic value and quality of life. I was asked uh, by one of my students, well, what if you're uh, designing environmental control technology? Is that creating economic value? Well, if you look at the system analysis, yes it is. Because there is value to people living, uh, living lives and not being damaged by the quality of air or by the quality of water. Uh, so the, I think that combination is important there. Mm. And you're saying that in looking at the long term, we, we shouldn't uh, neglect the transitional technologies that are going to... That, that's an apt summary. With the mm -hmm. pyrolysis, again, we know that we have to generate heat somehow. Uh, there's some very interesting hybrid technologies. For example, the notion of combining solar and nuclear is something that's been talked about for hydrolysis to make hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Very interesting idea. We also have these enormous reserves of methane under the sea, the methane hydrates. Uh, can those be put to use? Well, one assumes that they can. Uh, so again, the, uh, the notion of biofuels as being a means by which in principle you can have no net CO2 is important. On the other hand, if the permafrost melts releases so much methane, a much worse greenhouse gas, that the carbon dioxide emissions don't matter, then you know, it's, it's, you've, you've uh, set things off already. But uh, again, yeah, I think the pyrolysis techniques are, are closely enough founded to the techniques. Again, it requires burning some of the material to generate heat to use it. We also know that some biofuels are not carbon neutral. Alcohol from corn is decidedly not carbon neutral. You use a great deal more water. You generate a lot more CO2 by plowing those fields and by the different activities that you carry out. So again, Chemical engineers are used to systems thinking, we're used to doing material balances, which is what carbon management is about, ultimately. Indeed. Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Yes, I quite like your, uh, your discussion about uh, yes, chemical engineering and also the demarcation of the discipline into the uh, tools, the uh, uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned fundamentals uh, like transport mm -hmm. and also um, uh, the systems approach mm -hmm. and so on. But um, do, do you think, especially because you were a president of ASCHC, do you think there is a, a shift 
in, uh, in chemical engineering towards the, uh, uh, if you like, some of the uh, more modern applications like uh, uh, bioengineering and, um, uh, and biological, I mean, other biological aspects, energy and so on, away from, uh, from fundamentals. I, I, I'm saying this because, for example, yeah. I'm, uh, I, have, mm -hmm. I have several colleagues in the U.S. from mm -hmm. the older school, if you like, for example, mm -hmm. in the area of transport. <laughs> and uh, some of them uh, feel quite passionate about, uh, about fundamentals. There was an interesting study that uh, Dr. Yang Luo of Praxair and I ran last year. She and I had led the study on alignment of academic and industrial expectations of new graduates. And we were looking at different industries. We were doing surveys. We were doing workshop. And it was very interesting that even the people in the oil and gas industry were saying that new graduates that come to us should know about biology and life sciences. We may not be working on it now. We may be working on it now, but it's part of the future. So there's a shift there. But I think uh, one of the things that I did during my presidency of AICHE was be very concerned about the idea that it was di two different camps. Partly because in the 1980s, I remember how uh, when it came to uh, chemical engineers saying they're trying to steal our profession away from us. It was materials people they were talking about, not bio people. I would argue that the development of materials and the development of bio have been sort of to balance the product side of chemical engineering with the process side, it's, it's not really chemical engineering unless you have both pieces there in the system. But yes, research that we have that's on fundamental bioscience, fundamental systems biology, uh, all is very pertinent to the long-term future of chemical engineering. My argument here was that because biology and life sciences have been shown to be based on molecular sciences, that makes it intellectually a natural part of chemical engineering. But in the U.S., when uh, oil and gas was suffering and complaining in the 1990s and uh, the aughts, it was a chance for the life sciences area to grow very productively. So now that oil and gas has come roaring back, I think there's more of a, a balanced partnership. I think there is a concern about whether the process side has kept up with product side. And Europe and the UK have been much more advanced in the area of process intensification, of process invention of high intensity processes than the US has. And there's current activity to try to balance that with the help of our colleagues in the UK and in, in Europe. So yeah, I think it's definitely part of our future. Visionary lecture, sorry, I can't get used to this <laughs> chair to using this. Um, uh, I mean, I don't think uh, probably most people in the room have some association with chemical engineering, so you're not trying to uh, inspire people to become chemical engineers in this venue, but who could fail to be proud to be a chemical engineer now and of the uh, profession that's going to go into the future? Uh, based on what you've you've said today and your vision of that, um, I'm pleased that you've at the end you picked out Pope Francis there as probably the most famous chemical engineer, <laughs> reminding me of uh, the story where two chemical engineers are in front of a board explaining the process, and uh, one mm -hmm. says that yeah you know, we can explain every step until the penultimate step. Uh, and the other one said, well, what happens there? He said, well, a miracle happens. <laughs> and so probably we need all There's the help we can get. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank you for a lecture that, that took us all the way from molecules of cellulose and a splinter of wood to uh, chemical engineers reinventing the world and, as you showed, even ruling the world. So thanks very much indeed for coming and the, the short hop from uh, <laughs> Mechenj and the, the large hop from North Carolina. We'd like to thank you very much indeed for an inspiring lecture uh, please join me in thanking Phil for his lecture, and I'd like to present you with a gift, which is a jewel clock, so that you can oh. look at what's happening at home as well as when you're here. Excellent. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you.